All right, and it looks like we have crossed that uh, one minute past the hour mark, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's very special webinar, A Conversation with Anne-Marie Slaughter on Women, Men, Work, and Family. I'm Bree Reynolds from Flex Jobs and One Million for Work Flexibility, and I'll be running things behind the scenes today. Before we get started, I have a couple housekeeping notes to go over. First, this webinar is scheduled to last about one hour, and we will do our very best to stick to that time frame since we know everyone has busy schedules. Uh, next, this webinar will be recorded and made available for viewing after the event. You'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow with instructions on watching the video and information on all of our panelists and handouts. And finally, you can download a handout with information on each panelist and organization here today by going to the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you don't see your control panel, just look on your screen for a little orange arrow. And if you click that orange arrow, the control panel should magically appear. And then you can go to the handout section from there. If you have any issues as we go through the webinar today, I will be on the back end answering questions. So you can also use the questions box if you do need any assistance uh, from me. Now, I am really excited to pass the floor to Jessica DeGroote, founder and president of Third Path Institute, and with big thanks for her um, coordinating this very special event. Jessica, thank you so much, and take it away. Thank you, Bree. Um, well, I'm really excited about today's event, too. I think not only do we have an amazing person and advocate for issues that Third Path has been uh, fighting for for 15 years, that caregiving is important, and the way we can really uh, address gender equity and caregiving is by bringing men into caregiving. So we have Anne-Marie Slaughter here helping us uh, have a really wonderful conversation about that. I've also asked some special people to really help us with this conversation. Um, so you'll be hearing from Matt Schneider. Um, he's the co-founder of City Dads Group, a community of 6,000 dads now in 23 cities across the U.S. And so Matt's going to be um, part of the conversation today and is a wonderful example of a, a dad, involved dad himself. We also have Emma Plum, director of One Million for Work Flexibility, who's here. They're a national initiative creating a collective voice of diverse organizations who support flexibility for all. So you can see, Anne-Marie, we've actually brought in some people who really get your message loud and clear, both on the flexibility side and on the dad side. If you don't mind putting up the next slide, Bree, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening on today's webinar. So I'm going to first get Anne-Marie to talk a little bit about our book. I have a slide that I'll be putting up there that talks a little bit about some of the wonderful different sections of her book that she's addressed. Then Matt Schneider is going to be talking to her about what happens when the baby arrives. She's got some great theories and ideas and tips about what we can do as men and women and caregivers when the baby arrives. After that, Emma Plum is going to be talking with Anne-Marie about, yep, there's the baby, but we still have children around for 18 more years, and we have elder care. So what do we need to be doing? And again, Anne-Marie's got offered some really smart ideas about what we need to be doing, not just in our own lives, but in our workplaces to really create better flexibility. And then last but not least, I'm going to be having a chance to talk with her and someone named Jim Sandman, who's the president of Legal Services Corporation. I've known Jim for a long time. He's an early advocate for men's involvement with parental leave. He himself took paternity leave with his son, and he'll be talking a little bit about his experiences and how we can make wider change. So it'll be Anne-Marie, Jim, and I talking about how we can reimagine careers and leadership. I'm really excited about today's call. So let's put this first slide up, the next one, Bree, and we'll talk about Anne-Marie's wonderful book. Anne-Marie, thank you for being here today. As you can hear in my voice, I'm super glad you're here. I'm super glad you wrote the book. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but you've been on a journey since this book came out. Any big thoughts you want to share that you've learned since writing the book, and then we'll talk a little bit about your book. Jessica, thank you, and it is a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Where you start is exactly right, that I published the, uh, the article, it, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, in The Atlantic in June of 2012, so now four years ago, exactly four years ago. And when I published that article, I was really thinking, look, women still face a whole bunch of obstacles uh, if they're going to try to have careers and families like men do, and we just haven't made nearly as much progress as many people think we have, so we still can't have it all. Here's what we need to do. Four years later, 
I think that part of the reason we haven't made as much progress as we should have is that we're focusing, uh, in some cases, on the wrong things. We're focusing almost entirely on advancing women and discrimination and lack of confidence uh, and, and just sheer numbers of women at the top. And instead, we ought to be focusing on care. Uh, and we ought to be focusing on the valuing care as much as we value breadwinning. And we should be focusing on it for men, too. So that, that's that been the journey. And that's why we're here now talking about care and men uh, and really how everybody uh, can uh, lead more productive lives and have time to care for the people they love. Yeah. And what we're going to see as this uh, conversation unfolds is that Anne-Marie's done a great job of kind of pulling apart the puzzle and looking at the different aspects that we all need to pay attention to to make change. Some of it we can do ourselves, some of it our organizations need to do, and some is going to be around public, smart public policy. And if you're excited about what you hear today, you'll see on every slide the hashtag MenWomenFlex. Please join the conversation and tweet about what we're talking about today. What a great hashtag, men, women, flex. It really sums it up about what we're trying to look at, that we can all, men and women, figure out how to flex to be involved with these other very important spheres of our lives, caring for our children, caring for our aging loved ones. So I wanted to start the call by having you just a couple minutes. We, we're going to be on a timetable today. But just a couple minutes, talk about the beginning of your book. You do a great job pointing out that, yeah, uh, we thought this was a woman's problem, but it turns out there's some other challenges going on. So I put up some of the half-truths you talked about in your book, meaning that, you know, the assumption that if you're just, if, as a woman, just committed to your career enough, you can move ahead, or you marry the right person, you can move ahead, and if you just sequence it right, you can move it ahead. Well, what I think I took away from your book was, yeah, that helps, but that's not the whole story. What are some half, other half-truths you learned about, either around men or the workplace, that you think are worth underscoring today? Right. So your point is very well taken. This is why I call them half-truths. These are all true, but they're not the whole truth, and we need to, to push further. So thinking about men, uh, for instance, we have this, this pervasive uh, Kind of saying, children need their mothers. And people say it, I actually, in my book, I talk about uh, a, a man who drives me frequently uh, in a taxi, and he says to me, children need their mothers. And he means that really in a complimentary way. He's saying to me, you know, mother love is so important. And my response is, mother love is so important. But it's not more important than father love. And it's not actually different, in my view, than father love, even though you know, men and women are different, human beings are different, and so we express that love uh, differently. Another uh, men that we hear all the time is a man's job is to provide, actually in the Bible, and I think it may be in the Quran, it, it is this, yes, that's what a man's job is. Fundamentally, what we mean by that is provide cash, not care. Well, yes, a man's job is to provide, but a woman's job is to provide, too. In my family, I'm the principal provider, even though my husband earns a good income. Uh, and why don't we think about both men and women providing uh, cash, but also care? Uh, move to the workplace. And, and this one is the one that drives me <laughs> crazy, that all these issues of family, we still think of as women's problems. Women's groups address them with by women to women, women's issue because we think care is a women's job. We'll never get there if we think about it that way. So it's not a women problem. It's a human problem. It's a care one who has children, parents, spouse, siblings, disabled family members, whatever it is, it's our problem. Yeah. And then similarly, you have flexibility as a solution. And that's also true. Again, these things are true, but only half true. Flexibility is the solution, but not if people who take advantage of flexible policies are then stigmatized, as they are. Right? Flexibility stigma is as big a problem as not having time in the first place. And then just the last one, and this 
this is so pervasive, particularly in the United States, whoever works longest works best. You know, the person who logs 14 hours just has to be a better worker than the person who logs 8 to 10. And I just don't think that's necessarily true. Sometimes, you know, the person who stays long late to get something really important done, yes, that's essential. But let's evaluate results. Let's re evaluate output, not input. When I see people who are staying consistently long at the office, I wonder if they have a problem with time management. Yeah, wonderful. So you have set the stage perfectly. We're noticing that your voice is sometimes clear as a bell, and then a little bit, uh, we l lose you a little moment, so just um, maybe it's, uh, we'll, we'll pay attention to that. It's probably just fine. I'm just bringing that to your attention. Um, we'll put up the next slide, because what we're going to do is... happening to you too. Yeah, um, it might be just where you're sitting, um, maybe just kind of staying at the right distance from the computer. Um, if you want to say a little something, we'll check that your sound quality. Okay, but it, when you, it's happening when you talk to me as well, so I don't think it could be me. Oh, there you go. Okay, wonderful. All right, good. All right, great. Sound problem solved. So what we're going to do next then is um, have you talk a little bit about kind of over time, how do we put some of these ideas into action? And I actually have Matt Schneider talking about this whole idea about along comes the baby, what do we do? So take over, Matt. What, do you, what would you like to have Henri think about with you? Oh, well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Anne-Marie. It's fine. It's nice to finally connect. We've been connecting on Twitter and email for so long. It's great to to finally meet you in another uh, technological way. Um, and I want to say also, you're one of those people that I've been quoting for the last many years since your article came out. And uh, all these guys that know me around the country know uh, know your work and uh, know how important your voice is in this conversation. So thank you so much for. Uh, for bringing this to national and international attention. Um, one of the things I think I've learned from Jessica is that uh, couples, uh, whether they be two men, two women, or a man and a woman, really want and need to pursue a career, and they both want and need to be good parents when a baby arrives. And in, as far as I'm concerned, it's never too early to have that conversation about how you're going to, to make that work. Uh, what have you found about the conversation a couple needs to have uh, even before the baby arrives uh, in order to make life work and, and Thank work you. work? So Anne Marie, uh, we might uh, you might have some thoughts about how to how to what you've learned around how to have uh, couples get that conversation started. And we might be having some technical difficulties. I'm checking that, uh, Matt, you can hear me speaking. I can hear you, and I don't think I'm, or I haven't heard your voice break at all. So I'm yeah, it, it's the it internet. Seems like, it seems like we might have lost Anne Marie for just a second here. If you guys would like to um, fill in the, uh, the answers here while we see if she can get back on. <laughs> Sorry about That's that. Fine. No problem. Um, all right, so um, one of the things that uh, well, we can certainly cover this topic, and then when Anne-Marie gets back, um, maybe it's having her uh, uh, unconnect and then reconnect to that same um, link, and then we'll just uh, talk a little bit about this section of the webinar and then have her join when we get to the flexibility part. Um, so one of the things we've really learned is what Anne-Marie talks about in her book, is that this uh, idea of having a conversation with your partner is super important. And I think, Matt, you would agree that it's not because there's one right way for couples to then solve this. It's actually the idea that you really want them to find what's right for them. So for example, you, um, you've really worked with a lot of dads, and you yourself are a dad, um, I bet you've learned a lot about the conversations that you need to have uh, and what it maybe was like for you to have that conversation. Do you remember your first conversation about all this? Absolutely, and I, it was before we even got married. Uh, my my then-girlfriend and I were talking about what our life would look, look like when we got married. Um, both of us had uh, stay-at-home moms, uh, and that meant something to us, especially uh, in the early years, so we wanted to figure out how to recreate that. So 
uh, we talked about where we wanted to live. We talked about uh, what kind of finances we would need to support that lifestyle, and we figured. We also talked about uh, who could take a step back in in our in my in it turned out my career, and who could be kind of full force into to her career. Uh, so for us, it was very very intentional, and we we talked through a lot of uh, areas kind of across the gamut of careers and finances and, and the lifestyle that we wanted. That's a wonderful point. And I'm going to check. It might be that we have Anne-Marie back with us. Can I hear your voice, Anne-Marie? Um, well, I'm here. <laughs> there you go. We're now hear hearing you. And what I think you're hearing is that, uh, that uh, Matt did a great job of thinking outside of the ro of kind of gender roles and really being open to thinking about uh, something you yourself figured out that you don't have to follow traditional gender roles inside of a family system that really what the oh, goal is is to find a, a solution that works for you. And that's, and that's absolutely, absolutely right. I think I think really what we're talking I'm sorry hold on a sec. So if you mute the if you switch to telephone okay. 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 And We're so just about link. there. Hang on one sec. Yeah. Th okay. okay. Oh, that that work? Yep. Okay. So uh, you know, one one thing uh, that Matt was saying is exactly right. You can, you can be intentional, and you must be intentional, but you also have to allow for how life happens. As, so it's very important, I think, early on with your partner before the baby arrives to talk through possible scenarios and to say, you know, depending on where we are and in our respective careers, but will you be willing to move for me if if that's necessary? Will you be willing to step back uh, and, and be the lead parent if that's necessary? You know, sort of, I, I actually go through a bunch of scenarios uh, in my book that, that they may not happen, but it's important that you know each other's expectations early on because if if you are partnered with somebody who says well yes of course I want to be an equal parent but I'm not going to defer a promotion in my career I'm not I, you know I'm going to be an equal parent but I'm not going to make career compromises well then then <laughs> that may that may not be where you want to be uh, so you can talk about it in advance and that but then it's really also being willing to uh, Roll with what happens and be equally engaged in the the care and the navigating the the, the trade offs that you may well have to make for your career. And I wonder, Anne Marie, as you've been talking to people around the country about these issues, um, how, how how the generations might be changing in terms of the roles they expect to take. Are they still uh, looking uh, across gendered lines as they they get married and they start to have a family. Well, I do. I think it's getting much, much, much better. And the younger men in my own workplace uh, absolutely expect to be equal parents. And a certain number of the women in my workplace at New America are the principal breadwinners, uh, and they have uh, their their mates. Uh, sometimes husbands are are the ones. Uh, at home, I, I think that a growing number of younger men are seeing this as as how they want to forge their own paths. Uh, sometimes they can look up to uh, uh, men whom they admire who've done this, and and role models are very important uh, in uh, just as they are for women in the workplace. The men need to see men they admire who've made made these choices. But also, I think a sense of you know I'm going to do things differently than my father did. I'm going to have a different relationship uh, with my children, or indeed caring for a parent. Uh, so I do see a lot of uh, desire for change uh, among millennials. And I want to underscore the point that we we continue to make as we wrap up this portion of the call. Uh, that these are co conversations need, that need to be had outside of crisis. You, know, you don't have these in the moment when you're trying to uh, find a nanny for that day because you are both both have important meetings at work. These are conversations to have well in advance of, uh, of crisis. 
<laughs> yes, uh, and I, my brother actually, uh, who is an investment banker, said to me that it was the most important advice he got that all of us have those moments where we feel like you just, it's just not working. It's just not working. That is not the moment to make a life or career decision. <laughs> you, you want to talk about it in advance, and when you hit those bumpy points, you want to just think, okay, let's get through this, and then let's step back and figure out if there's a solution. Excellent. Well, thank you again for uh, for uh, joining the call, and I'm going to pass the uh, the call back to Jessica to introduce the next portion of the call. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, and what you said, Anne Marie, is so cool because you talked about role models, and so let's put up the next slide, Bree. Um, and we actually have a great role model with us. And actually, I've also put another a picture of a book up that I think is a great um, book out there about making the case for paid uh, parental leave. But another way to make a big case for a paid parental leave is to have a dad talk about this. So welcome, Jim Sandman. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience um, many years ago taking paid parental leave and what you learned from that process? Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Jessica. Twenty-six years ago, when my wife and I had our first child, I took a six-month sabbatical to be a full-time dad. I was a partner in a big law firm at the time, Arnold & Porter. I'm a lawyer. My wife is also a lawyer, and she was able to take no more than three months maternity leave. I, I began my sabbatical the day she went back to work, the day our son turned three months old, and I stayed home to care for him until he turned nine months old. I didn't work at all during that period. My firm paid me at half the rate I would have been paid during that that time. It, it was just a remarkable experience. Our son is now 26. He is himself a lawyer. Uh, I don't think he has any conscious recollection of those six months that I spent at home with him now, but I'm confident that it affected our relationship profoundly. Uh, but one of the other long-term benefits of my experience was that it had a big impact on my career as a manager. I went on to become managing partner of my law firm. I've been general counsel of a public school system, and I now head a, a, a major national nonprofit corporation. And the lessons that I learned uh, during my sabbatical have really affected the way I look at parental issues in the workplace. So I'd just like to describe uh, quickly five lessons that I learned from my experience that affected my perspective as a manager. None of these lessons, I think, would come as news to any mother. But I think they come as news to a lot of men, uh, including many fathers, and especially to men in senior leadership positions in business. The first lesson was that I found caring for a baby full time as being uh, difficult and stressful. <laughs> I was I was shocked. I I thought that I was basically going to live my life with my son on my back. <laughs> that I would spend six months going hiring, hiking, I would go to art museums, and he'd, he'd be along for the ride, literally. And it was nothing like that. It took him two hours to get through a bottle. So each feeding <laughs> was, was itself uh, a lesson. And I, my life lost its structure. I, I lost my ability to, to plan. Um, I, I found it demanding, even when I wasn't working at all, outside the home, and when I had no traditional job to have to balance against my family responsibilities. So that made me realize, in a way I wouldn't have otherwise, that when a primary care parent is dealing not only with the pressures of family responsibility, but also with the pressures of the workplace, anything an employer can do to help ease those burdens will be among the most valued benefits the employer can provide. The second thing I learned is here, here. Caring, for, caring for a baby full time is isolating. I was alone most of the time during the day. The only regular substantive contact I had with adults when my wife was at work was once a week for two hours when I went to mother's group. I took, <laughs> I took my wife's place in mother's group. It was six new full-time mothers and me, and I craved the adult contact. I found it was really important that my wife arrive home at night at a regular predictable time. I needed to know when my shift was over, when I'd be able to talk to her, when we'd be able to share childcare duties. I also cooked dinner every night, and I needed to know when it had to be ready, and then when it was ready, that she'd be home to eat it. So I learned that good management of people requires recognizing the importance of predictability of schedule, uh, particularly for people with families, and that the person who needs to be home at a fixed time isn't uncommitted, 
or unprofessional or suffering from some kind of character defect. The, the third thing I learned is that finding child care you're comfortable with is really hard. Before I had this experience, I had thought that as long as you were to pay for quality child care, you had an array of attractive options to choose from. But I um, found during my sabbatical, when one of my responsibilities was to arrange for child care when I was going to have to go back to work full time, that the options from my perspective as a full time dad didn't look so great at all. I ultimately was able to arrange for a nanny who came in during the day when my wife were, and I were at work, but I, I didn't feel great about the arrangement. And the day I went back to work was one of the hardest days of my life. I, I just hmm. didn't take any comfort in the care I had arranged. I, I couldn't concentrate. I thought about my son every minute. It was weeks before I could uh, could could really concentrate for sustained periods at work. And what I realized was that benefits like full-time on-site child care are just huge. Uh, my law firm subsequently did open a full-time on-site child care center and I realized that my experience would have been so much better if in going back to work I could have brought my son with me in the car and known that he was only an elevator ride away. Uh, the fourth lesson I learned was that the opportunity my firm gave me to stay at home and care for our son was a tremendous benefit not only to me but to my wife. Father-friendly benefits are one of the most effective ways to help mothers. My wife was able to go back to work herself in about as good a frame of mind as possible because I was able to take over the full-time care of our child from her. And the, the last lesson I learned, um, and this echoes what Anne-Marie said in opening, work-life balance issues, work-family balance issues are not just women's issues. If we think of them as women's issues, there's a real limit to how much progress we can make in achieving real work-life balance. Work-life balance policies and programs that focus exclusively or even predominantly on women both reflect and contribute to that societal pressure that regards child rearing and family responsibilities as women's work and as less than what people think of as real work. And I think that prejudice imposes more work-family balance pressures on women than on men because it gives women more to balance than, than men. So those are the, the lessons I've learned. It's a long time ago now since I did that, but I try to, try to carry them with me in my, in my work as a manager. And Anne-Marie, as you can see, now you know why I had Jim Salmon join us. Um, uh, here's, here's a dad who really has been an advocate for his entire career around your thoughts. Um, and you can see he learned those lessons really well and he's taken them into the future. Any, any thoughts about that before we go on to the next slide, Anne-Marie? Well, Jim, it's just so wonderful to hear all of that, and, and you're, you're right, my husband would say all the same things and would say, none of this is news to women, <laughs> but it is news to men, and it does absolutely change your perspective for everyone uh, whom you, you uh, manage, how you run a workplace, uh, how you see people in the round. But also, you know, what I, what I love hearing is it changed your relationship with your son. You know, my husband has a, a fully equal relationship with our sons in that they turn to him as much or sometimes more than they turn to me. And that has been, uh, I think, something he would say has been a great gift in his life, just as, as we as mothers, uh, you know, there's the downside, but it's also a great gift. Wonderful. Well, wonderful. I knew it was important to get that voice out there, uh, again, supporting your important message, Anne-Marie. I'm going to put the next slide up, um, and we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to move it on beyond the baby, um, and I'm going to have Emma um, talk a little bit about, you know, flex for the next 18 years and some of the lessons you teach in your book about that. <laughs> you want to share some thoughts with us there? Thank you so much, Jessica and, and Anne-Marie. It's really just such a pleasure to speak with you. We're so thrilled to have you here today. Super excited about this conversation. Um, and yeah, jumping on in, let's let's talk more about the longer term um, because, of course, this conversation you know doesn't start and stop at the newborn phase. And I'm actually um, the mom of a soon-to-be one-year-old, so I'm uh, I'm on this end of the spectrum at the moment. And it's abundantly clear to me that life is never going back to where it was before I was a mom, which is absolutely wonderful. But um, but a reality that we have to acknowledge um, when we talk about caregiving and work, that this is 
isn't just about parental leave and it's not just about the first few months of parenthood, but really um, how to get what you need at work over the long haul of raising a family. Um, and beyond raising a family, also um, taking care of aging parents, which is a reality for, for more and more of us. Um, and so the crux of this really is that fitting in room for both care and career over the long haul uh, requires flexibility in the workplace. Um, and that might mean working from home sometimes, it might mean working a flexible schedule, starting and ending late a few days a week, it might be for a short term or a more permanent solution, but whatever it looks like, we, we really need room for those options. Um, and just a few of the bullet points up here, so one of the key steps towards getting that flexibility is um, to have a conversation with your boss, as you note, um, to speak up about the flexibility that you need and formally request it. Um, and then another technique that you recommend is really to train your boss, um, to, to nudge your <laughs> boss in the right direction. That's such a great, <laughs> such a great suggestion because, you know, as you say, if you don't set your own boundaries, no one else will do it for you. And um, if you, you know, say, let's check in about what's most important on this list, um, then, then that can really help shape, um, shape workflow. Um, but of course, people tend to be concerned that they might seem like they're not committed enough to their jobs if they set those types of boundaries. Um, and so you have this this great slogan, if family comes first, work does not come second, life comes together. Um, so can you share a little bit more about what you mean by that and how you've seen it play out in your own experience as a worker and as a boss? Yes. So the first thing to say is, as a boss, I have found that having this philosophy, uh, if family comes first, life doesn't come second, but life comes together, it, it has ensured me that I have highly productive employees who are deeply loyal. Because when someone uh, sends you an email, uh, it just happened last week, you, you know, a death in their family, a health care crisis, a uh, child, uh, it, it depends where your children are as to the nature of the crisis, but they know they can say, I have this problem, and your response is going to be, well, of course you have to take care of that. I trust that you'll get your work done. It, it, it's treating employees like adults, but it also means they, they are very loyal and very committed uh, to, to getting it done. So that's my point about if you let people take care of crises in their family lives, uh, if their work won't suffer. They'll get it done, and they'll be much more happy uh, and, and much more productive. And the other thing I always say is I don't actually want people working for me who would put work ahead of a child who was in crisis or a parent or whatever it might be. Uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, day to day you, you always put your family first, but it means when there's a problem, uh, you do. Uh, the second thing is this is actually a key to just better management. So many of us as managers, and I am certainly one, uh, don't take the time to set the priorities. We tell people to do things. But it's easier just to spew out an endless list of things to be done than to think in your own head, OK, wait a minute, what is most important? And what really needs to get done? Often when you do that, you discover that some of those things that you asked that uh, you're an employee to do maybe didn't need doing. Uh, and you weren't being very efficient, or you weren't being very conscious and deliberate. Uh, about the work that needs to be done. So that when for those of you who are employees and, and you, you need to train your boss right, to say, if I can't get everything done, what's most important? You're helping your boss be a better boss. Fantastic. No, that's absolutely true. And I think when we talk about flex, um, we talk about it really as a need, not a want. It, it, you know, it, these things come, come up. Life happens. And um, yes. so absolutely. Um, if we could move to the next slide, Bree, please. Um, Other direction? Yep. Um, and more perfect. Um, so again, as we think about caregiving and career over the long haul, uh, it's, it's helpful to take a step back and look at the the big picture of both of those over time. Um, so people are living longer today than ever before. It simply no longer makes sense to think about retiring at 65, both because it's often not financially realistic anymore and, um, and also really because people want to continue to work well beyond that stage um, in many cases. So looking at this slide really, which is from, from Third Path, thanks Jessica for this, um, to put things into perspective, 
There are uh, different phases of life and career mapped out here that make it clear that needs really shift over time. And with that in mind, you talk about the importance, Anne-Marie, of engaging in interval training and really letting go of the classic idea of climbing a career ladder. Um, can you share more about um, your take on that? <laughs> yes. Uh, so this actually hit me when I was reading uh, an article about top athletes, Olympic athletes, and it was pointing out that the more, uh, it, the harder you go as an athlete, then the more downtime you need. So that to get into peak physical perform uh, shape, you need to train in intervals. And many of us uh, on a Stairmaster or something have seen, you, know, you go hard for, for three minutes and then you slow down. And, th and I thought about that in terms of uh, our lives, that instead of this assumption that you enter the workforce and you go hard until you're 65 and then you stop and you don't work until the rest of your life comes to an end, uh, that that's just not the, isn't, a, uh, it doesn't fit with the rhythms of human life in terms of when you have children or when your parents age or other, other uh, family uh, things that happen in your life. But also, it, it, it's just not good for us in terms of getting the most out of our careers. So I urge people to think about their career in terms of intervals where they can go hard, and then intervals where they're still working. Most of us have to work, and most of us want to work. Uh, but you're working differently. You're working in a way that allows room for people you love, or if it's not people you love, maybe it's uh, volunteering in your community or some other outside passion. Uh, and that means there are, you know, there's that period zero to five, which is very intensive uh, with young children. Also, very important for those for your children. You're you're actually shaping their brains during that period. Uh, and many of us may want uh, to slow up a little during that period. And then your children go to school, and many people find that's a period where they can can go hard again. Although as you're kids get older, there will be more and more things that happen in school that need you. Uh, and then you get to that critical teen period <laughs> uh, where your children may be making choices that will negatively affect the rest of their lives. And that's the kind of care that you can't outsource. So I tell people at least plan for the possibility that you may need to slow down or, or make a lateral move uh, to more independent or part-time work during that period. Uh, and then later, there's the period where your children may be out of the house, but your parents are aging. Sometimes that happens at the same time. Um, so think about it as intervals. The really exciting part of thinking about your career this way is what I call phase three, which is you know, when your kids are out of the house uh, and if, if you don't have elder care responsibilities, there's this period, I'm about to enter it myself, where I'm in my late 50s. My young, uh, el youngest son, I hope he'll be out of the house. Whether he goes to college or not, we'll see. Uh, but you know, I look at Hillary Clinton, and I think if she wins the presidency, she'll be 70. And she did not run for office until Chelsea went to college. So her entire career as an elected politician, as a senator, as a presidential candidate, as a secretary of state, uh, and who knows, as president, will have happened after her children or her daughter left the house. And I, for one, find that hugely invigorating. I, I don't have a limit on when I want to stop working, although I do know I'll want to work differently. And of course, at some point, as I really get older, uh, you know, I, I will unquestionably slow down. But I think it's just a much more exciting way to think about your career. No, absolutely. I'm I'm in the brain shaping phase at the, at the moment. Yes, it's you are. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it is crucial to think about these different phases, and you feel so yeah. in the moment. But um, but we need to think beyond that. Great, um, Bree. Let's just take a quick look at the next slide. Um, and really, we talked about some of this already. Um, just that as we think about flex and um, you know making room for care, this is really also about making changes that benefit both men and women in the workplace and their workplaces as well. And 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 um, really by taking that integrated approach to work and life, um, 
you know, workers become better at prioritizing, they take time to recharge, they're more proactive rather than reactive, and then workplaces really reap the rewards of a more productive, happier, and more loyal workforce. Um, so we did touch on that, and um, I think, Jessica, if we move to the next slide, and I'll turn things back to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you well, so much, Anne-Marie. So, Anne-Marie, you've, you've been on a journey, you've learned something personally, you've written about it, which is that basically when we do this, when we encourage men and women to follow this more integrated approach where they um, do work effectively but also create time for their lives outside of work, whether that's kind of in an ongoing way or going back and forth between a more fo work focus or caregiving focused way, they are really learning some important skills that we think are actually important for today's workplace. And I knew that we were going to be having this call, so I wanted to make it special for people um, if they want to, Third Path has actually learned from all the leaders we work with that there's a skill set that's teachable. We call them our OMG groups, our Overwhelm Mitigation Groups, and we're going to be launching a group in July where we're teaching some of these skills. And if people want to tweet today, hashtag OMG, hashtag men, women, flex, we will actually enter them in a raffle to get half price off of joining one of our OMG groups. And we teach this, all that you've been learning, we've been really learning together that there, we're making better employees and we'd love to help you on that journey to be one of those integrated employees. So let's put up the next slide. We're on to our home uh, stretch for our call today. We're going in the, uh, there we go, the three-pronged, uh, we go back, there we go, one more back. Okay, so where we're going next is thinking about, okay, so the baby comes along, we've got flex for 18 years. What we're really talking about and what you've done such a great job talking about in this book is we're really reimagining careers and reimagining what it means to become a leader. Um, and that that's another powerful lens to look at what you've written about in your wonderful book. Um, it's actually something that Jim Salmon talked a long time ago um, about when I first met him too and that we really need people to be able to follow this more integrated approach to their careers, and we need some people at the very top to model this integrated approach. In fact, what I really feel like you've done, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Bree. Oh, I actually have a slide where I talk about some of these leaders that we've worked with. Um, so we, you know, just like uh, what you've done, Anne-Marie, we have a number of leaders we've worked with who've actually really followed this integrated approach. Um, and what we're really seeing is that they're using that skill set that we're talking about in those OMG calls around how to do work effectively in an integrated way, and that flex is an important part of the careers that they've created. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, please. So your book really gets at that there's kind of a three-pronged approach to change. And this is where I want to get us to, is a kind of conversation about how we can move this change process forward faster. So you've talked in your book about how men and women need to be thinking together with each other about how to do work and family differently. Um, you're talking about our workplaces and how they need to be doing things differently and supporting that flexible approach. And you also talk in our book the, your wonderful book about how public policy needs to reinforce this different approach. What I wanted to do is illustrate that with one simple example of how all three need to work together and get your thoughts on this. If you don't mind putting up the next slide, Bree. So you make a great, many, many great points in your uh, book, but one of them that I really appreciated was the idea that when it comes to paternity leave, a lot of Countries have experimented with how to do paternity leave right. And you're, you noticed that some of those countries that were more successful really made it something that the expectation was that the father would take that leave as opposed to opting in to taking that leave. And what I think you saw in that is that it was the workplace had to change and public policy had to change and the families had to change to really make paternity leave stick. Um, and I loved your point that to really uh, make that happen, you had to get it to be normal for a man to take paternity leave. What did you have, what did you learned around how these three factors, what our families are doing, workplaces are doing, and public policy are doing, can work 
together or not and get in the way of each other when trying to make changes like this? Well, the cont countries that have uh, made uh, paternity leave uh, the default option or, or sort of use it or lose it have seen real changes. Germany, uh, Norway, Denmark, uh, where what they've done is to, is not just to say, you know, you, mothers get this much and fathers get this much, but there are two months of what they call daddy leave. Uh, and daddy leave is if you don't take those two months, one month in some countries, two in the other, well, you just lose it. Uh, and what that's done has been essentially to have a social reset. So as one CEO of a Scandinavian company said to me, that when he gets a, a job applicant who has not taken his parental leave, he worries about that man's character. He thinks, why would you do that? You've had a child. It is your responsibility to care for that child. You should want to care for that child if you, you have the child. So if you get free leave, right, why wouldn't you take it? So this is a good example of where you, you want uh, individual couples to be having these conversations and you want uh, two men, two women, or a man and a woman to say to each other, look, if we're going to have a child, we're going to share everything equally, uh, and we're going to be equally responsible. There's not going to be a primary p parent and the other helps. I mean, sometimes over, over time, you need to move to that role, but at least starting out, that's what you're going to do. You need a workplace that says, you know, our workers are also caregivers. The, the era when you had one full-time caregiver at home and one full-time breadwinner uh, in the office is long gone, so we need to make room for care. And then you need government essentially changing the default <laughs> and saying, uh, I think in the United States the best place to the, the the way to go since we don't have paid maternity or paternity leave is simply to move directly to family leave uh, and to require uh, family leave uh, that can be a social insurance program or an employer mandate. There are lots of different ways to do it that that have different economic impacts. But the point is that it sends a cultural signal in the same way that having a law against sexual harassment. Uh, sends a cultural signal or uh, against discrimination uh, on the basis of race, religion, uh, or, or ethnicity sends a signal. It says this is what we expect of our citizens. And here we need to say we expect all of our citizens uh, to uh, you know, care for those they love and we will make this as uh, easier where we can uh, and and w expect employers and, and families uh, to participate. Yeah, wonderful. And here's a super bonus point. Not only is that a great story about that boss who understood looking for an employee who valued that part of himself was something he really benefited from. Uh, there's a wonderful researcher, Linda Haas, who's looked at Sweden, and she sees that by men taking that two-month leave, it's changing the workplace, too, because yeah. now, yeah, they're not just thinking women are going to um, take time off when a baby comes. They are now assuming men and women take time off when a baby comes, and that's a huge change that's happening in workplaces, too. Yes, I think of it as there's going to be the parent period. Right? Yes. In other when you hire young people, they're going to hit their you know late twenties, early thirties, whatever it is, and there's going to be the parent period where you're going to, if you want that talent and it's great talent, you've got to make it possible for them to have the families they want, uh, you know, either biological or adopted or constructed families, uh, and make, uh, but for parents, not for for women. Yeah, and, and again, this is an everyone issue because obviously some people might not have children, but everybody's got parents who are going yes. to age. And so yes. what your book has said all along, and I think we didn't have enough time to talk about it. I skipped over that slide, but one of the other favorite parts of your book is how you talked about um, you had ah, that the you always understood that what your father and grandfather had done was important, but this book and the journey of writing this book helped you understand how important the role your mother and your grandmother played in caregiving and the big message about how we need to become a society that values caregiving. Um, so that was just music to my ears to really help us understand that's where we want to go um, is to create uh, changes at home, changes in the workplace, changes in public policy that really promote 
both competition and caregiving. Really wonderful. Well, where Thank I want to, yeah, wonderful. It's music to my ears. I read the whole thing a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> next slide. We've been kind of setting the framework up to have a discussion with you. Uh, hopefully, everybody's heard. You know, there's some things we need to do when babies come along. Things we need to do when we have uh, the rest of those 18 years, or for elder care, to really think smart about how to wor work effectively but also have time to really be engaged and energy for caregiving. But you have to admit, it feels like sometimes it's been a glacially slow <laughs> of change. And so what we wanted to do was just, just have a conversation with you for a minute if you've had some insights um, around what you think will help promote more change more rapidly, um, what do you think are the barriers to change? After we hear from you, we're going to uh, actually see if Jim wants to add a couple of thoughts and then Matt and Emma as well. So when you think about this issue and you've been thinking long and hard about it, what are some of the things that will promote more rapid change or what are some of the big barriers you really think still exist? Well, uh, you know, the, the biggest barrier right now in the United States is uh, that we do not have what I call an infrastructure of care. Right? We have an infrastructure, often crumbling, of, of competition, of, of trains and planes and ports and roads and broadband, but an infrastructure of care uh, is are things like paid family leave, so you don't lose your job uh, if you have to care for someone if you, you that, and that you can afford uh, to, to care for a new baby uh, or, or for uh, a, a parent. Uh, but also things like much better and higher quality and more affordable daycare and elder care and on-site daycare is an enormous benefit, which actually we had in World War II when we needed women in the workforce because men men were at war. Miraculously, we found the resources to have on-site daycare. So there's the biggest thing right now, given that it's an election year, is to hold our politicians accountable for where they stand on these issues and to say we are not in the 1950s anymore. We, all of us are working and giving care. Uh, almost, uh, again, it, it doesn't have to just be children. All, uh, almost everyone has someone in their lives they'll need to care for at some point in their lives. Uh, and so w w that's the biggest issue is political uh, and let's ask government uh, to deliver better policy. And then let's expect uh, of our employers uh, that this is uh, as important as health insurance. You know, what benefits do you have and, in terms of how are you making time for my ability to care for, for others? And to make clear that's a, a very attractive uh, reason that you would go to a workforce uh, or that's very important in retaining you. And Speaking up, of course, for workers who have less economic leverage, uh, who have less choice, uh, and, and insisting uh, that this is important for everybody in a workplace. And then finally, again, uh, you know, for the men, when you talk to the men in your lives, to the women, you should be expecting that they will be not only uh, there to provide care, but they will be just as good at it and just as competent as you are. However you expect men to treat you in the workplace, well, that's the way you should be treating. However you expect men to treat women in the workplace, that's how women should be treating men at home. Wonderful point. Wonderful. Well, and what would you say is some of the, so, so one is that we need a better infrastructure of care. Um, and, and maybe I'll get Jim to add his thoughts in a second, too. Is there one, besides the fact that we don't have that infrastructure of care, what, is there another barrier that comes to mind that you think is uh, keeping people stuck? And after, after you share a couple words there, I'm going to ask Jim if he has some thoughts about what some of those barriers might be. Well, Jim and I actually both said it. I think the biggest barrier is that we just keep talking about this as a woman's issue and addressing it to women and uh, that until we say, no, this is not a women's issue, it's a care issue and it is for everyone, we can't break down the the mental and cultural barriers that are keeping us locked into a world where men are expected uh, you know, to provide uh, income and women are expected to provide income and everything else. It won't work that way. Right, right. So a huge shift is going to be 
having uh, men really join us in this conversation as equals. That's wonderful. Jim, you've been listening in. Um, any thoughts about what are some of the forces that are kind of going to promote more change or one of the barriers that hasn't been discussed already? Well, I agree with Anne Marie. I think we've been thinking and talking way too small, and and I like the term <laughs> social reset. That that's what we're talking about. I mean, I, I think of it this way: how, how do people currently think of the test for whether a workplace is father friendly? Well, that the test seems to be: does the workplace have uh, parental leave benefits that are available to men, and if they do, can a father use them without being fired? I think that's a really <laughs> low bar. <laughs> I, yeah. I, think the yeah. test should, I think the test should be whether a father can be a full partner in child rearing and family life and rise up in his organization, including to the top. And that's going to happen only when male senior managers using, are using the benefits and advocating for the expansion of parental benefits. And that's not going to happen without a lot of other things going on, including the, the development of the infrastructure that Anne-Marie talks about. But, but what we should be aiming for is where senior people are leading by example, to the ex and they're using the benefits to the same extent that women do. Um, I think one of the barriers, when I ask myself, well, you know, what causes people and institutions to change? There's nothing like self-interest to motivate people to change. When an employer perceives behaving in this way as, in their as being to their competitive advantage, uh, as promoting efficiency and, and quality within the, the organization, then they'll do things differently. But we need some people out front showing the way, showing that it can happen and that they can uh, perform at the top of their game while they do it. Yeah, and you know, don't lose sight of the fact that men can model uh, this, even if they didn't model it earlier in their careers. We have one of our integrated leaders made a change that he could be involved with caring for his grandchild. Um, and talk about a, a CFO modeling something very, very different for a very wonderful reason. Um, so terrific. There might be one quick thought that uh, Matt wants to share, and then I'll check with Emma, and then I'm going to give the final word back to Anne Marie. Matt, a thought you had about a barrier or a um, opportunity? Uh, I think the real opportunity is is actually uh, happening in New York. I got to be part of a great roundtable discussion with the Department of Labor yesterday, where we were talking with various people in the room of how the, the paid leave uh, parental or paid care law is going to be executed in uh, New York in the next several years. And you had people at the table from the Department of Finance and the Department of Health and all these people brainstorming about how are we going to actually make the, the law that has been passed happen. And for those that don't know, it's 12 weeks paid leave uh, for both parents. So making this law work in New York could have ramifications across the U.S. Uh, that I'm really excited about. Wonderful. That's really good news. Emma, is there something that makes you feel hopeful or a little barrier that you want to put on the table? Yeah, on the hopeful side, just briefly, um, New Hampshire just passed a law last week around the right to request flexibility, and um, mm. they're the, the only the second state to have such a thing. But you know, that's that's movement, and sometimes the second one moves other folks along, so <laughs> that's exciting. Um, and really, I'm just encouraged by all the work you know, the great work everyone on this call is doing and, and just having these conversations is so critical and, you know, for our audience now to go off and to continue this discussion so that um, we can really normalize all these all these things around care and flex so that at some point none of it is surprising anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anne-Marie, I am going to give you the one last word. One thing hopeful for people listening in today uh, that I'd like to share is that all of those amazing leaders that I was talking about earlier um, made this happen in their lives without all the support that um, we want to still have happen. So I think it's important to, to remind people that just like Anne-Marie did in her household, Jim did in his household, Emma's done in her household, and Matt in, her, in his household, having that conversation at home, even though we don't have those systems set up outside of us perfectly yet, can still help us navigate more effectively around these issues. So you don't have to wait. You can make this happen today, and Third Path would love to support you in that process. Anne-Marie, it's been a pleasure. Is there a last word of wisdom or thought you'd like to share? And we're going to put up our thank you slide as the last and final slide. 
So I would say two things in closing. One, just quickly, that we need to treat the men like Jim, like Matt, the men who are actually out there being equal caregivers and lead parents. We need to treat them as heroes and pioneers. Uh, they are forging a new path the way Gloria Steinem and her generation of feminists did for women. Uh, and the, the, you know, back in the 70s, the women who did this were treated very badly and uh, called all sorts of names. We should be celebrating them, these men as pioneers. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is this is the week that the f first time in American history a woman was nominated to be the presidential candidate for a major party. We have made incredible progress. When I was growing up in the 60s or the 70s, that was unimaginable. I didn't know any women anything. I knew one woman lawyer, no doctors, no politicians, no professors, no engineers. And so we've come such a long way. What we're talking about now is the next half of the movement for full gender equality for women and for men. And to finish the business that the women, second wave of the women's movement began, we now have to change male gender roles as much as we've changed female gender roles. And we have to see all of us as full human beings who have a caring side and a competitive side and who should have the ability to uh, live full integrated lives when they can, it, they'll be better workers, they'll be better parents and, and caregivers uh, for their parents, uh, they'll simply be better and happier human beings. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Anne-Marie. It was a real pleasure. Well, I enjoyed it very much and I'm delighted to meet the others on the call, at least uh, by audio <laughs> as well as by Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, Bree, I don't know if there's any wrap-up process we need to do. Sure, I'll just say everyone be on the lookout for tomorrow's follow-up email with a recording of today's event, a PDF copy of the slides, and a one-page handout with our panelists and organize the, uh, excuse me, organizational info for everyone you've heard today. Uh, and thank you very much for attending. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.